Shalom everyone, and today we study Parashat Naso, uh, the longest parasha in the Torah, I think. Uh, you can find it on uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 4, verse 21 and on. And the beginning is kind, it raised, yesterday I was reading it, last night, and I was thinking, it's a, it's not really clear. Because it starts, and God speaks to Moses, וידבר אדוני אל משה לאמור, נשא את ראש בני גרשון, גם הם לבית אבותם ומשפחותם. Raise the head of the children of Gershon. Also, you know, also, what I mean also, where, you, where are you starting from? To their paternity, uh, to their paternities according to their families. So you go back to the uh, previous uh, parasha, the end of Amidbar, and over there, there are two things that are really important to realize. One, we spoke about it, it's in the beginning of Bamidbar. The words of God to Moses saying, I want you to do a census to the people, it doesn't say census, it doesn't even say count. He says, Seu et rosh, raise the head. And the Zohar teaches us that it's not that God needs to know how many Israelites are there because he's God. He, like, he doesn't ask, need to ask us how many. Okay? That he, has the, uh, he is, as the Maimonides says, Hayodea, Hayadua, Vamada. He is the, know the knower, the knowing, and, and the knowledge. So, uh, how can you, he, we have to give him the information? Impossible. Like, uh, so the Zohar says you need to appoint, and that's a meaning, appoint every Israelite to his defined job by raising his head, which means when you give somebody a job and you tell them that you can't have the job done without them, that's raising somebody's head. If he was going like this, now he's going like this. I'm important. I'm being account, taking account for. Okay? So now, the same expression, exactly. Naso et rosh b'nei gershon. Exactly the same verb, the same expression, but about the children of gershon, one of the most important families of the Levites. So you go, you're like, where is this starting from? So of course, we started to talk about the Levites at the end of Parashat Bamidbar. And what does it say? Uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Vaidaber Adonai Moshe velaron lemo, and God speaks to Moses and Aaron, saying, Naso et rosh bnei kehat, raise the head of the children of kehat. So just a second, so here we have uh, the pointing of the Levites to their jobs, each family of the Levites had a different job. Why don't we start the next parasha on chapter 4, verse 1? Why do we have, uh, why would we have to start it with chapter 4, verse 21? Which means the context is starting the blessing to the children of, of a, uh, the Levites, Levites, okay? So, when we read um, the interpretation of the Kliaka, one of the big commentators of the Torah, uh, and it says, I, I, make it short, I make it short, but it says, Ayano uh, limnot chilai b'nei gershon abechor. When we're talking about the uh, families, they go according to the order of birth of the father or the founder of the Levite families. Okay? Gershon were supposed to be the first ones. However, Kehat was chosen to be the first one. Why? And the answer is because the, the family of Kehat they were the, the Ark of the Covenant carriers. They were responsible to carry the Ark of the Covenant. 
And because the Ark of the Covenant is the most important, and because the Ark of the Covenant has the two tablets inside, which is the whole like concentration of Mount Sinai revelation and the Torah, so they, whenever the, the, uh, the tribes were traveling in the desert, the Ark of the Covenant was going first, leading, leading the camp and protecting the camp. And because they are the carriers of the Ark of the Covenant, therefore, the Kehat were mentioned first, and that's the beginning of chapter 4. That's what the Kliyakar is saying. However, Gershon was the firstborn. So God did not want the people of Gershon, the family of Gershon, to be humiliated. Okay, because they are the firstborn of Levi. So therefore, it says Gam also give them a special honoring. Okay, and let the parasha of Nassau start with them. Okay. Lomar Baze, Shiratza Kadosh Bohu says a clear card. God wanted to show that he to respect the wise people. Okay. And anyway, he wanted to, to teach us about respect. So the people of Kehat who were carrying the ark, they got their respect. Gershon, who were the firstborn of Levi, in the order of the importance, they were also giving their, their honor by being the ones that start Parashat Naso. And what is our message? Our message is, again, and as addition for the parasha of Bamidbar. Parash Remember Parashat Naso and Bamidbar, they are always around Shavuot, they are being read around Shavuot, which is towards the end of the counting of the Omer. And the message of the counting of the Omer is uh, overcoming narrow-mindedness, overcoming uh, child childish thinking. You know, children do not have the ability to rise above their emotions and feelings. And our job during the seven weeks between Passover and Shavuot, if we want to step up and receive the Torah, we need to take the responsibility that being hurt, hurting others, it's, it's issues for, for children. You want to achieve anything of greatness, you need to be respectful, you need to be worried about other people's feelings. You need to be sensitive. You need always to be that person that makes people feel elevated, supported, and taken into account. If you want to achieve anything productive in this world, it doesn't matter if it is your family or your community or your uh, job or your country, this is, this is the basic rule. And if you don't accept that, the rule of Naso. Naso means lifting up someone's head. Make them feel important. Because when they feel important, when they feel they're connected to, to a vision of making other people's life important because people need you. And the fact that they need you makes you special. And we all, we all of us, we need each other. So we know that companies, families, countries, in which every person is being taken into account, they are more productive, they flourish, they have bliss, all the godly blessings are coming in. And that's the first thing. It's in a simple, simplest layer. That's a simple thing about if we want to understand the message of true freedom, which is the message we have to apply to uh, between Passover and Shavuot, the counting of the Omer. And this is important, this, this is so important that it's being mentioned twice in the beginning of Parashat Bamidbar and in the beginning of Parashat Naso. Okay? So, of course, there are deeper messages behind the story because the story, the question is about the Levites. Why the Levites have such an importance over here? And here the Zohar is telling us about 
about the whole thing about the Levites. And he says the Levites, we, when we know about the uh, division of the nation of Israel into three systems, the Kohanim, the priests, the Levites, okay, that are the tribe of Levi, and the rest of Israel. So till today, when you know, when you ask somebody who's Jewish, you ask him, are you a Levite? Are you a Kohen? Are you Israel? There's three divisions. And most people don't understand what does it mean. It's not just a family heritage. It's something that is much deeper than that. Because Kohen is the representative of the angel Michael, Michael, which is the archangel of Chesed, loving kindness, Abraham, right column, the power of the uh, the uh, uh, the fo the uh, uh, foundation of the energy of uh, water, okay. And then we have uh, on the left we have the Levites, left column, judgment, and that is fire. And then you have in the middle central column that's Israel, and the, as I said, the the left column is uh, the negative aspect, the judgment, and it's also Angel Gabriel. And in the middle you have the Angel Nuriel, central column, balance, Nuriel, Uriel, the initials Michael, right, Gabriel, left, or Nuriel, center, you get Magen, shield, Magen David, the shield of David. What is the shield? When we have all three columns, we get the shield. How do you create that central column, all three columns? So you need the Kohanim that also are mentioned here in the parasha, and you need the Levites. And here, but what does that mean? And the Zohar says as follows. Uh, let's... Uh, in the Zohar of Asulam, verse 10, yomam Hashem chasdo. We're quoting from the book of Psalms uh, 42. Every day, God is giving us His chesed, right column, loving kindness. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Oh, how this day is finished. And there was a night, there was a day, one day. Night and day, we're talking about there was no sun. By the way, to remind you, uh, on the, first, the sun was created on the fourth day only. So what? how could there be a night and a day? We're talking about judgment, left column, the night. We're talking about loving and kindness and sharing. That's the right column. And there are one, it means there are one is one central column okay this is the most important work of every human being okay so how do you do that and he says every day god is giving us his grace and love and kindness unconditionally this is his, this is what it says in psalms 42 about that verse yomam hashem chasdo. this is the chesed this is the power of the Kohen. This is the, the, uh, uh, the founding power of water and sharing. Okay? What's the end of the, the next part of the verse? And at night, his song is with me. Night, left column, judgment. Okay? Okay? And this is like also the, uh, the power of Gvura judgment and shiro shiro song singing who were in, in, responsible for the singing in the temple or in the tabernacle the levites why the zohar says because in order to create happiness excitement and singing you need the left column you need fire creativity is fire song is fire excitement is fire you need both and therefore you need two forces which means the fire without 
without the Kohen, without the Chesed, without love, the fire can consume the singer, the singing, and finally bring into a uh, burning down of everything. Everybody knows when we want to get excited and it's excitement that it's all about us, it's high, we get high and then we buy in the morning after. Okay? And sometimes it doesn't take to the morning after. It's much shorter lived. If you want the excitement to endure, you need the energy of the Kohen, the energy of love. So we're not talking about, oh, there were Kohanim and Leviim and Israel. No, no, we're talking about the three column system inside each one of us. You need to create the excitement from within. Singing is excitement. You know, a lot of people's art work is like a song. Why it was done with excitement? That's left column. That's fire. <coughs> left column is not evil. Left column is not supposed to be subdued and be thrown upon or being shut down. Left column without left column. You can't live, you can't create, you can't generate, you can't make a tikkun. You need the right color, the loving, the kindness, the Kohen energy in order to balance the two. And that's the central column and that's how you get the shield. Your life shield is when you know to be creative and excited with a lot of fire, that you're not uh, afraid to ask, to, re to ask for yourself, to desire, to dream, to have ambitions. On the same time, it needs to be uh, adjusted and uh, uh, harnessed with loving, kindness, and caring for others. That is the secret of everything, the whole Torah. So, how do we do that? <coughs> the Zohar is talking about, on one hand, when it is night, when it is darkness, when you feel the judgment, turn it into happiness, turn it into creativity. And we know, even when the person is feeling upset and depressed, you put happy music and you start dancing and you think positive people, things about others. Or even better, you just, in, instead of dancing around your own table, you just dance by doing stuff for others. You just run to do good for others you will see how the depression will disappear. Why? Because you bring the chesed in, the fire is being harnessed, and now it generates work. You know, fire can create life. Without electricity, most people in the world will die. No electricity means no water, no heating, no, no air conditioning, no traveling. Uh, it's over. But every time you use engines that generate electricity and heat and power, you need cooling agents. The big water and uh, electrical plants are built next to water to cool it down. Okay? You need the water and the water is the energy of chesed. So when you have only fire, what happens when, like in the um, in the nuclear reactor in Fukushima or in uh, Chernobyl, they exploded when the water supply was cut off. And the moment no more water came in, the fire, the heat, went uncontrolled and then it brought into a meltdown that generated so much destruction. So we are built the same way. We need on one hand to generate fire through ambition, excitement, actions. We have to, okay? However, you need to bring in the sharing, the kindness, and the love. And that, you know, if you generate ambition and so on, you have to say, like, who else is going to get the profits or the uh, benefit of what am I doing? So if you think that if you're going to make yourself excited and happy about making gains only for yourself and everybody else around you will be hurt, forget it. That, that the Zohar 
The Torah talks about it later on. You'll pay for it for the rest of your life and even afterwards. But if you harness the ambition with the energy of water, the cooling agent, then you create the central column, desire to receive for the sake of sharing. That will energize you so much that will give you the shield against all the dangers of life. Now, I'm making it short because there's so many issues in this parasha. <coughs> this parasha, many places in the Zohar, speak about this parasha because it's always around Shavuot. And Shavuot is about seven weeks after the Exodus. The Israelites, who were under slavery and torture for so many years, they simply came out from darkness into the light. Within seven weeks, they came to Mount Sinai and they, because they had nothing to lose, they didn't have properties, banking accounts, ego. Everything was like gone as being slaves. And they didn't have enough time to gain new ones. They came united, totally united to Mount Sinai. And then the heavens opened up. And they heard God's speaking, everyone, all 600,000 men from 20 to 60, and all the women, the same age, and all the children and the elders. We're talking about two to three million people. Everyone heard the law. Everybody experienced it together. Each one experienced a little bit different. Why? Because each one is a little bit different. So we experience things differently. That's why we need each other in order to see the complete picture. And when they got it, that's how all of that energy has been released. And we still, every year, celebrate it as the holiday of Shavuot. Now, The parasha is carrying the message because that was kind of a test. We were not ready, probably, and we lost it 40 days later, and we are working on getting to that place since then and on. And that means every year, every year and the whole year, why do we study the Torah that was given on Mount Sinai? Because we want to achieve the Mount Sinai revelation and not the second time, but this time it will stay forever because we mature, we, we matured, we grew up, and we really got it by hard work. Okay? Now, there's few stories in Parashat Naso. They, they look like they're not connected, but they're all connected. They think about the Levites and the respect we have to give to every person. Oh, you got the job, forget about it. It's like, you know, you have to overcome your ego. No, we are not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to tell people to overcome their ego. We're supposed to tell ourselves all the time to overcome our ego. And we have to overcome our ego and we have to be um, available with unconditional love to other people for us to overcome our ego. And that's why we need to be always sensitive for other pe people's feelings without making the calculations about, oh, I just gave you an opportunity to overcome your ego. It's very easy, especially uh, when you think you're spiritual, but it doesn't work like this according to what the Torah is saying. Because God could say, you know what, I gave you the honor, forget about it, and you should be appreciative of it. And don't even dare to be upset. No, sensitivity. The next thing is, uh, on chapter 5, verse 5, by Adonai Moshe and God speaks to Moses, saying, The Ben of Israel talk to the children of Israel, Ish o Isha, a man or a woman, Ki yasu mi kol chatot adam. If they do, when they do, any kind of a sin or transgression from all the sins of Adam, who started the sinning? Adam. That's why we call the children of Adam in Hebrew. Bnei Adam. 
Why? We're here because of a sin. Okay? Limol mal badonai. Veashma nefeshei. Each person that is to be blamed is in fault. He made the transgression. Vitvadu et chatotam asher asu. They should confess. They should... <coughs> and the word in Hebrew is not confess. That's a usual translation. Vitvadu means and they should... Um, uh, the word vadai means certain. Confirm. Confirm what they did. And then they should pay for it. Which means they should atone for it. And there is a whole thing about what's called the atonement, which is the teshuva, wrongly translated as repentance. It's not repentance. Teshuva means teshuv. Hey, and here comes around the, the holiday of Shavuot, the concept, again, the concept of teshuva, returning back. We are humans. Humans do make mistakes. It is normal to make mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you're probably not alive, okay? And if you're alive and you think you didn't make mistakes, or you have a big, big, huge problem, okay? The question is not about making the mistakes. Most of the times we have no choice about it. We make the mistakes because we're losing it, because we don't know enough, all kinds of excuses, it doesn't matter. The question is, you realize you made a mistake. What do you do right now? And the whole issue of Mount Sinai revelation is that you make a mistake, don't give up. You're not doomed. You're not going to rot in hell forever. You, nobody can redeem you. Only you can redeem yourself by your own direct relationships with the Creator. That's called Teshuvah. Teshuvah means coming back to your cut-off connection to the Creator. Because what does it mean? You made a mistake, you disconnected from God. What does it mean, Teshuvah? You reconnected. Which means it's all about your relationships, our relationships, individual relationships, direct relationships with God Almighty. He is there unconditionally loving us. Our job is not to give up on ourselves because He never gives up on us. And therefore, when it says that Sheva Ipol Tzadik Vikam, King Solomon in the book of Proverbs, a righteous person will fall seven times and get up. And I spoke many times about it. The whole thing is not about the falling. Even righteous people fall because if they don't fall, they so what are they doing over here? We are, we are here in order to correct, not in order to be perfect. We're here to perfect. So, righteous person is not somebody who never makes a mistake. You know, people don't do anything, don't make mistakes, which is the biggest mistake because you don't do anything. We're here to do. Read Genesis chapter 1. We're here to do. And if you do, you make mistakes. And the point is not to be afraid of making mistakes. The point is to go with all your might, to do what you think is right. When you realize you made a mistake and you fell, if you really trust God and you really love God and you really know that He loves all of us unconditionally, you know that just for His sake, you'll get up and try all over again. Why? For him, giving up is not an option. Why? Uh, he created us to be fulfilled with his pleasure. The moment we give up, this is the biggest and the worst transgression we can ever commit. And therefore, giving up is not an option. Falling happens. If you're not if you're afraid of falling and because of that you don't do anything, that's a huge transgression because by that, you're just telling God, you gave me a life that I cannot handle. Impossible. 
The handling is simply getting up again and again, as it says in the Ethics of the Fathers. Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva says, Yagata umatzata tamin. You make the effort, you'll finally find it. In unintentionally. What does it mean? Because you work so hard, you'll be rewarded with a solution. Einstein said, you know, the logic that got you into the trouble won't get you out of it. So how do I find another logic? You try, and you try, and you try. You never give up. It's called hope. You know, when you try enough, you'll be rewarded with the right thought. The help will come. As it says, Call a bali You want to purify yourself. You want to become better. You want to do tshuva. You'll get the help from above. No, it's not your job to ask if it's logic or not. Logic has nothing to do with it. The logic that you have got you into the into the mistake. So how do you earn a better logic? Make the effort. Don't give up. Try all over again, and you know you'll be rewarded. So that, that is the whole issue about the Teshuvah. The Teshuvah is about coming back. Teshuv, hey, returning your individual direct connection to God. And what if you try ten times? Try again. Stopping, stopping to try, that's the end of your physical life. And then you'll have to come again and to continue from the place you gave up in the past. Failing is only temporary. Winning is eternal and it's predetermined. You have no choice about it. The choice is how long would it take and how much effort you have to put inside. You better do it fast. So that's about the Teshuvah. That's why the essay of the Teshuvah is so long and so important over here. But then, and that is basically, that knowledge is so crucial because the knowledge of Parashat Naso, if you see carefully all the prophecies of the great prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they're using the concept of Parashat Naso again and again and again. Because that concept, when this is being achieved, and perceived by humanity, this is the messianic age. Nobody can save you but yourself. The moment you allow somebody else to save you, we're going back to the beginning, which means we were created perfect. Why did God break the world into pieces? Because we were created in the image of God and we cannot have free gifts. And therefore, the gift of freedom is not a gift. You cannot gift somebody with a freedom. Freedom you need to achieve by yourself. Creativity and success must be achieved on our own. That's called tshuva. Teshuva means that you're coming back to your connection to God, individual, personal God. When you have that connection without intermediates, you achieve it. You made it. Now it's yours. Now the enlightenment, the fulfillment, the, the connection, the atonement is at one moment, is yours. And when it's yours, no one can ever take it away from you. This is redemption. This is the messianic era. The messianic era is about individuals all over the world. Read Isaiah chapter 10. When would Messiah come to the world? When the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God, like water covered the sea. Which means the Messiah is not going to save you. You're going to save yourself. And when humanity saves itself, that's messianic age. Oh, there will be someone who will be a teacher, who will guide it. But the Messiah cannot do it for you. God cannot do it for us. The only ones who can do it for us is we have to set the fire. We need to harness the fire with water. We need to turn it into the synthesis of the, of the three-column system. 
And that what creates the shield, that's what creates the, the aspect of immortality. And then the Zohar goes into another concept, uh, the Torah. The book of Numbers, chapter 5, verse 11. Adonai Moshe Lemor. דבר על בני ישראל ואמרת עליהם איש איש כי תסטה אשתו ומעלה בו מעל. It looks like a story from really long time ago that has no relevance to our days and age. So why is this story over here? The story is like this. In case a person has an, not just an anxiety attack, but you know some people, you know you have a man that is and rage with jealousy because he thinks his wife is cheating on him. Could be for women also. And they lose it. Okay, what do you do with it? So the Torah says the man, the husband, should take his wife to the high priest. And then the high priest will give her a potion and she will drink it. Unless she says, no, 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 I admit I, I betrayed my husband. She drinks a potion. And what happens is that if she did not betray, she will become pregnant and have a baby boy. If she did betray, she'll start to swell till everyone will see that she made a terrible thing. Okay? We don't have the temple right now. For the last 2,000 years, what can we say? We don't have the physical temple. We don't have the potion. We don't have the high priest. So how is it relevant to us? And the Zohar says something really important for all of us. In the Zohar Sulam, verse 89, one of the most important uh, and famous parts of the whole Zohar, the name of this article is the article of the Sota, the woman who went astray. Okay? But the top of the page it says Raya Mehemna, the loyal shepherd, which means these are words that Moses appeared himself, his soul, appeared to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and taught him that important issue. Okay, so that means it's a very important issue. And he says the story of the Sutta was about a healing. A healing, which means connecting to the tree of life. Because again, if the husband was really jealous and zealous and upset, and there, there was a problem, there was a problem. So giving the healing water to the wife will cleanse her name and relax the relationships. However, if she did not, she was not loyal to her husband, she will swell and everybody can see that will be horrible okay so what is that to do with us and the Zohar says Kein Israel this test it's called the test of the Sota this test will happen along the last redemption and many prophecies connected to the last redemption can be found also in the book of Daniel. And you'll find it uh, in the book of Daniel, pay, uh, chapter 12, when it says, a lot of people are going to be cleansed, purified on those days. And these are the ones that are going to be tested, like the Sutta. Because the, what's going to happen during the last days, during the time of redemption, before the final redemption, the whole world is going to be tested. The whole world is going to go through really hard times. Okay? Those who are really loyal to the husband, which means who is the wife, we are the wife, we are the female, we are the creation, we are the female aspect of the universe. God is the husband, he is our, you know, he is the creator. So the ones who will be loyal, connected 
They're going to be tshuva and always trying to connect, even if they fail to connect back to the Creator, those ones will be able to withstand that test. And they and the whole hardship of the Messianic era will make them pure, cleaner, and more exalted. On the other hand, there will be other people who will be choosing disloyalty. They will be choosing materialism, any kind of whatever concept of idol worshipping is about. And any addiction is an idol worshipping because you're giving away your freedom, your image of God to substance or someone outside of yourself. And that's idol worshipping. And they will become, under the pressure, they will become even worse, more selfish, more negative, and more suffering. And then comes verse 19. This is based upon another very famous verse in the book of Daniel. Uh, again, the book of Daniel chapter 12. And the, the, the verse is, Vamaskilim. Yazhiru Kezoa Harakia. And the ones with knowledge will shine like the splendor of the heavens. And that is the on based on this verse, the name of the Zohar. Zohar is that splendor from this verse in the book of Daniel. Okay? Which means with who the people who have the knowledge and the wisdom. They are the ones that all what's going to happen on, during that era is going to make them more pure, more exalted, and more conscious. And then Ra Moses is telling uh, Rabbi Shimon, because the people of wisdom, they really will be able to connect to the sphere of Bina, which means they, the, fee, the connection that God is there always to protect you like a mother that's a consciousness of bina and then it says they will shine like the splendor of the heaven zohar harakia with this book of yours says moses to rabbi shimon which is sefer hazohar the book of splendor which is from the splendor of the upper mother which is called teshuva which is called returning, coming back to your connection, to your individual, personal connection to, your, to God. The people who are connected to the Zohar and the conscious and the study of the Zohar, which means to be able to decipher the verses of the Torah and to see the unconditional love of God, to see that the rules of the universe are there for us to see that the only way to get out of our troubles is to take responsibility and to return to him only this when you are connected to that state of mind says moses those people connected to the real depths of the wisdom of the zohar they do not have to go through the test they pass the test which means they do not need to experience so much misery and troubles. And Israel are going to taste from the tree of life, which is the Zohar, which means you want to connect to the tree of life, it's a Zohar. Not that the Zohar is another teaching than the Torah. The Zohar is simply the inner <coughs> dimension of really understanding the Torah, so we use the Torah as a mean to connect and return to our Creator. Okay? Whoever is connected to the Zohar will come out of exile with mercy. Okay? And then, there are more about it, but uh, there's so much more to learn. So, there are more about the redemption, but we have to remember, we are right now 
in a very crucial time in the history of humanity. Never been before that humanity were like a global village. We are all experiencing all of that together. We're all in it together. We are experiencing Armageddon as we speak. And Armageddon is a war. It's a world war. The war is a psychological warfare, which means we are experiencing, like in ancient history, but especially today, a psychological, psychological warfare. There's a psychological warfare against most of humanity, instilling fear, terror, upset, uncertainty, because that's a way to control people. You know, the organized religions were all about terror and fear, because that's how you kept people together. That's how you kept them in the fold, by scaring them. Okay? <clears throat> Governments, tyrants, dictatorships, they thrived on fear. The fear created disability, mental disability. And on the decaying of people that are full or motivated by fear, on that material thrived all tyrannies and dictatorships. Now it's a time, as we said, that the earth should be filled with the knowledge of God. And whoever is connected to the study of the Torah, from the internal aspect, from the aspect of, of the Zohar, then you become protected, you become immune from the terrorism around. Terrorism is not people killing people. Terrorism is making whatever is possible to terrorize people so they become disabled to think for themselves. That was like this for thousands of years. People were subjects, okay? They were uh, property of their leaders. Now we're starting to awake. And the way to awake, we need to control our consciousness. We have to control the flow of knowledge and wisdom. Learning the Zohar is the biggest, strongest weapon against terrorism in the world. The moment you have the concept of true, real freedom, knowing that the only one in the world that controls your connection to God and to the, or you call it the universe, or spirituality, or the spiritual dimension, whatever you call it, you are the only one who is responsible for that and you are the only one who determines how it's going to be. Nobody should, could, would do it for you. When people realize that and they really invest again and again, falling and getting up, falling and getting up, their own personal individual connection, then you become immune, you have a shield a shield that will protect you from the warfare that's happening around us. And because the warfare is terrible, people have so much anxiety, so they become addicted to antidepressants, to drugs, to weapons, to all kinds of conspiracy theories. How do you know the conspiracy theory is a conspiracy theory? If it makes you a more fearful, and rage, angry person, that's it. You are a victim to psychological warfare. If any study makes you more certain, more positive, more loving, more caring, more sensitive, more empowered to care for others and raise them, then you're doing the right thing. Very simple, so simple, so clear. Because there's so many, you, today you don't know who to believe to. There's so many, so many organizations and government that have an interest to, as I said, to terrorize people. So that you read on the news all kinds of stuff and you have no idea where they come from. Same thing whoever knows. More than 100 years ago, when the uh, Tsar was thinking, when, Russia, when the Tsarist Russia was unjust and really they were very, very 
a, a thin layer of elite that they were very rich in the imperialist Russia and they exploited everyone that was so poor. Who did they blame? They were the Jews. They blamed the Jews and then they invented this book that is called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. That's an ultimate conspiracy theory, which means go and make a pogrom in the Jews and that's how you save Russia. This is so, so terrible. Finally, what happened to them? They collapsed and there was a Soviet revolution, the communist revolution. And they continued with the same, with the same concept, which means, look, if you take the nicest people, and you give them the power, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. How are we going to protect ourselves from anyone who thinks he's thinking the best for us? And that's why he deserves to take the power. If people are not going to have spiritual edu education and have this knowledge that we're studying the Zohar, there's no hope. For humanity and that's why we need to teach the Zohar and to teach that stuff because that's the strongest weapon in this war that we are engulfed with remember that that's a weapon how do you know the weapon helps you you don't get enraged you don't get angry you still focus more on to do good and less about fighting the bad guys because if you hate the bad guys you know, if you watch the last scene of the Return of the Jedi in the Star Wars, when the uh, Dark Lord is telling the Jedi, hate me, like, you know, you deserve, you should. And he said, if I hate you, I'll become you. You can't go with these conspiracy theories and becoming a hateful, uh, revengeful and fearful person because that means that you became a victim to the terror machine. You need to focus on becoming a loving, grateful, thankful, sharing, caring, and empowering person. And that is not going to come from reading and learning about conspiracy theories. What can you do about it? You have to be that person that cannot be threatened. And that you need to take from the Zohar. Yes, the Zohar speaks about people in the leadership that they are the enemies of the people. Okay? Big news. We never knew about it. Never happened before. What's the news? Were the people in the leadership centuries ago in favor of the people? Never. Okay, so what's the news? The news is that you have, there's a solution. You have to empower yourself spiritually before you become involved in world politics and economy and stuff like this. Uh, we, we go on. Not enough. To uh, then we have another weird thing that also has nothing to do with us. Uh, chapter six in the book of Numbers, verse one. By the Ber Adonai Moshe Lemo, the Ber Bnei Yisrael v'Matalim Ish or Isha ki Yafli Lindor Neder, Nazir Lahazir Laadonai. If somebody makes a vow to become Nazir, okay, translated into I don't know even how to it's like in the simplest the word is in Hebrew it's the word that is giving to what you call in the Christian world a monk somebody that separates himself from life he takes a vow of poverty no wife no children no family no assets whatever and he's dedicated or she's dedicating themselves to God only, okay? Although the Nazir of the Torah is not that kind of person, a Nazir can marry, have children and so on. Nazir is someone that does not engage with wine and uh, anything that is connected to uh, wine. And also they do not cut their hair. If you heard about Rastafarians, it's they take, there's a mystical thing behind the Nazir. Why? Nazir in Hebrew, is also a crown, keter. It's another word for keter. And the Zohar says, when you really go into that secret of Nazir, it's about connecting to the 
unconditional love of the creator to his creation. I don't want to go into it because we don't have time, but there's a long Zohar about it if you read it in the Zohar itself. And to seal that, we go, we jump to Bamidbar, chapter 6, verse uh, 23, which is a blessing of the Kohanim. Remember we spoke about it in the beginning, it starts with the Levites. But then it seals with the blessing of the Kohanim. Speak to Aaron and his sons and tell them how to bless the children of Israel. And here on verse 24, 25, 26 is the blessing of the Kohanim. God will bless you and guard you. God will shine light his face to you and will redeem you. God will raise, again raise, and so the same verse, the same verb, raise his face to you and will give you shalom. These three verses have 60 letters. The Star of David, which is the symbol of became a political symbol of Judaism. The Star of David has six points. Why the two triangles? Remember, we speak right, left, and center. That's the upper triangle. There's also the lower triangle. Together, we have six points. Each point has ten sefirot. Together, sixty. Sixty letters of the blessing of the Kohanim, which means. There is a power of protection in the blessing of the Kohanim. Okay, how do you use it? So first of all, in Israel and in Sephardic communities, every morning prayer, every shacharit, the Kohanim in a certain place of the prayer, they come to the front. If they are Kohanim, descendants of Aaron, the high priest, they come to the front of the synagogue. They make a blessing. Bless you, God, the Lord of the universe, that sanctified us with his mitzvot, and gave us, ordered us, to bless his nation, Israel, with love. There's no blessing like this in all the mitzvot. To bless his nation, Israel, with love. Then they turn with their back to the ark, and their face to the people, covered with the praying shawls. The people should cover their eyes, not to look, it's too much power. And then they say that exact blessing with the exact words I read. For 33 centuries, the Kohanim are doing it every day. Ashkenazi communities, they say that outside Israel there's not enough holiness, so they can say it only during the holidays. So it's better to be in Israel. Anyway, uh, every day the blessing of the Kohanim is being given, which means you want that energy of protection. You go to the synagogue to get that blessing. That's one thing. Another one, it says on verse 27, And when they put my name on the children of Israel, I will bless them. Which means the Kohanim will put the name of God upon the children of Israel, and then God will bless them. A lot of people take it literally. And then, if you uh, look at the Bible, you know, the, Bible, the Torah was written on a parchment. And in the weather in Israel, you know, which is humid in the, in the winter, Parchments did not survive only in the Judean desert, which is very dry all year long. And the oldest parchments that were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's 22 centuries old. Okay? However, a few years, a while ago, uh, during some uh, constructions in uh, Jerusalem, they found out an amulet made of silver from the time 
of King Ezekiel, which means about 27, 2800 years ago. And it was a little amulet from a foil, silver foil. And when they found what's written inside, they found Pirkat Kohanim, the blessing of the Kohanim that we just read, written on silver, somebody was carrying on himself for protection, which means the oldest part of the Bible, the Torah, that was found uh, from those ancient days from biblical times. People were carrying that for protection. Uh, so that's why these words are so powerful, being used. Fathers bless their children every Friday night after the Kiddush with these words. If you don't have a Kohen, you are the father, you are the Kohen of the house, so you can bless your children, your grandchildren, everybody around. Uh, and again, this is the power of Kohen, the love of God, the blessing of God. And after that, there's a weird story about the uh, chieftains of the tribes, the head of the tribes, the Nesi'im, Nasi, Naso, Nasi is the president, somebody that is above the others, was raised above the others. And he speaks about the gifts they gave to the tabernacle. Why here? Uh, there's a message, the message is really powerful, that all 12 tribes were uh, represented in the building of the tabernacle. It was everybody's part. Everybody had a share with it. Okay? And, and the finishing is amazing. The end of Parashat Nassau. Chapter 7, verse 89. And when Moses was coming to the tabernacle, let the berito to speak with him. And he would listen and he, and he heard the voice speaking on its own. It's not God speaking. The voice was somehow activated from the ark, above the ark. In, in between the two cherubim. By mistake in English, cherubim because they wrote it C-H, no, it's Keruvim, the little angels above the ark, and then Moses could hear it as a result of all of that, what we learn in Parashat Nassau. Remember, we need to be raised, to raise our consciousness, then we'll be raised above the suffering and the miseries of life, then we'll earn all the protection and the shields that the Torah has to offer us, especially nowadays. Thank you so much and stay safe.